Hello. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, I do youth ministry at Living Hope. I'm with Pastor Rocky Seto. Um, I think, is it Seto or Seto? A lot of people have been asking. Seto. 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 I'm Seto. so sorry. Mm -hmm. Seto. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, I know a lot of you have been able to watch our service. If you haven't, um, please listen to his story. It's just uh, such an encouragement. But um, I'm at church on a Monday. Thank you, Pastor Rocky, for meeting with us on a Monday on our off day. Um, it's such a privilege. But Mom, yeah, we have a pleasure. few questions uh, that um, hopefully can flush out some of the things that we've been thinking about, talking about, uh, maybe praying through uh, that um, hopefully could be helpful for the rest of our church, um, especially as we go in, get into cell groups and uh, have more conversation about it. Uh, but the first question I wanted to ask, uh, just to kind of set us up, um, since we're talking about relevance, uh, why does relevance matter so much um, to us as Christians, uh, to, to people? Um, how, how would you address that? Well, in essence, um, Christianity is a real um, lifestyle, and uh, to be a disciple of Christ, it's a full-on fully immersed lifestyle and uh what you believe should definitely come out of your mouth what you believe should dictate and govern how you live i mean paul writes in second corinthians chapter four i believe therefore I, I spoke you know we also believe therefore we also speak what are the convictions that we have about christ should be absolutely relevant to what we're doing you know and and, and when i say Relevance, I see that in, in, in all the right terms, you know, meaning we're not necessarily trying to fit in with the culture. We're not really trying to fit in with people, the world. You know, we're trying to be salt and light. That's what I mean by relevant. You know, like our Christianity, the truth of Christ, the biblical truths that we know actually shapes who we are and actually is observable by the world and other Christians that see us in our workplaces and our homes our sports teams, our church, you know, and so that's really what I mean by relevance, you know, how, how the truth of Christ affects who we are and what we do and what we say. No, yeah, thank you. That's, that's really helpful, I think, um, to, to define relevance. Um, what would you say to someone if they're trying to, um, I don't know, figure out, um, you know, because I think relevance is really tied to oftentimes the narrative of the culture and so what other people think uh, what they believe maybe are social groups um yeah. what would you say to someone who maybe cares a lot about what other people think uh, maybe what the their society what their friends relatives think um what would you say to someone who's kind of wrestling with that well here, here let me give you a sports illustration you know hopefully the sisters will understand what i'm talking about too but Whenever you're preparing for a game, let's just say life is a game, right? And you have opposition, you have people watching, all that stuff, you know. It's way more important to know who you are as a team than overanalyzing the opponent. Mm. The reason why what I'm talking about is that the more immersed you are with the opponent and what they the threats or what they could do to you, you forget who you are. And you can't be genuine to what who we are as a team or as a player, or as an athlete. So in the Christian life, I would say you major in Christ. You major in the scripture. You major in the things of truth. And then you minor on the culture. I mean, you like to be aware of the opponent. You like to be aware of their tendencies. You like to have an idea of what could happen. But you really want to major in on the truth. And, and, and what I mean by that is let's look to Christ. Bible says in Hebrews 12, fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith as we're, you know, as you're running the race, as you're running your life, because the more you focus in on Christ, the bigger he gets mm -hmm. and the culture and the problems get smaller. The more you focus in on the problems and the culture of the world, the bigger it seems and our God seems smaller. And so big God, small problems is what we want to be. That's where, as God told Joshua, be strong and courageous, knowing that I am with you. He didn't tell him to be focused on the giants and the issues of the day, but focusing on the Lord. So I would say, yeah, let's be aware. You know, let's not have our head in the sand. You know, it's not like we're called to live in some cave someplace till our Lord comes. Right. But 
let's really know who we are in Christ. And, and from there, that gives us everything. He gives us everything that we need to be salt and light. No, that's great. Um, yeah, I think Pastor Ben, he actually also referenced that Hebrews quote, uh, just, you know, fixing our eyes on Christ and that, nice. you know, hopefully our identity is rooted in him rather than the opinions of, you know, other people around us. And so thank you for that. And I'm sure uh, the guys will appreciate that, all the sports and, and uh, sisters too, you know. Um, and so uh, definitely thank you for that. Um, yeah, next, uh, so, you know, as people wrestle with, um, you know, quote unquote, more secular uh, things, um, I think, you know, what you've shared about a lot in your story um, with us is the idea that, you know, we have this tendency to make good things um, that, that should be in its proper order. Um, it, it becomes elevated. And so it becomes maybe an idol in our lives. Uh, and I think you also said it can be something we attach our identity to. Um, sure. If someone is listening to that and they're like, oh my gosh, my work or a particular relationship or my gifting or something has taken over and it has been the ultimate thing. What would you say to someone um, in that situation so they can actually reprioritize God as, as ultimate? Well, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, and such were some of you. And such were some of you, as Paul talks to the Corinthian church, where sexuality or like a, a, another idolatry or some kind of a stealing or being some kind of an illicit drug, being drunkards, used to define who the Corinthians were. I mean, this is what they gloried in. This is what I'm about. I live for the weekend. You know, I live to party. I live for... Uh, uh, my job, you know, and whatever that may be, Paul says, and such were some of you, until you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in, in the spirit of our God. Chris, I'd say this is that remember who you are in Christ. Let's not have gospel amnesia, you know, spiritual amnesia. Let's remember who we are in Christ. And then repent, simply repent, mm. you know, and as Paul talked about this, I rem I'm reminded of about Peter as Jesus washed his feet in the upper room, right? As our Lord served Peter. And, and as Peter said, it, well, if that's the case, if I can't have any part in it, unless you have this, if you do this for me, wash my hand and head and everything. But Jesus says, you're already clean and you just got to wash your feet, you know? And meaning once you're in Christ, we're already been washed clean. God sees us as innocent, justified. But we all know this. There's the, the, the life in this world is never ending. It's a tension between the flesh and the spirit. There are times where we have to wash our feet. And metaphorically, what I mean by that is we need to take time to repent of these things. And it's a constant adjustment that you need to do. You know, it's like going to the spiritual chiropractor. You know, the spirit of God convicts us of sin. We got to get back into alignment. Doesn't mean we, we lose fellowship with the Lord, obviously, but we gain greater intimacy whenever we give up these things and we're constantly. And I'd say this brother or sister watching, just know it's going to be a constant battle to the day we die. So it's it just a constant thing. We're, we're repenting to the Lord and to other brothers and sisters that we trust to keep us accountable. But it, I think that pleases the Lord that we're in the fight. You know, he doesn't, our Lord calls us to fight and engage in the battle with him. And, and, and that's where the encouragement lies. It's, it's going to be a constant thing, but God has wanted all for us at, in the end, you know. And so I would just say this, there's a, there's a warning to any professing believer. If a certain sin or certain thing or person is greater than Christ in our life and we're actually okay with it, I mean, here's one that may shock you, right? I'll just say, if you're willing to say, you know what? Family's my idol, and that's just what it is. If you're actually okay with that, that's a scary thing because the Bible says idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Meaning it's like, you know what? God understands. I love my wife, love my kids. I love them more than God. He understands. No, he doesn't. That's a very scary thing where, where God understands is this, there's a tension. You're fighting this thing, you know, and you're constantly fighting and battling this thing. So it's something to take very seriously, I'd say, you know, and, 
But there, if you're in Christ, there's ultimate hope. You just keep repenting and would come to your loving father. You know that you never lose that relationship if, if you're truly a genuine believer. No, thank you. I, I think the family example, it like stabbed me in the heart. And so I think for a lot of people at our church, um, you know, because of, you know, where our context is Orange County, I think that, that you know, you kind of mm-hmm. hit the nail on the head. And so... Um, yeah, that's something that, you know, I need to really be watchful of. And I'm sure a lot of other people at our church too. And so, um, well, the good, the good thing is that you and others, I'm going to say the same thing where, you know what, I need to be watchful. That's an issue. You're never acknowledging that uh, it's not a big deal or it's like, this is who I am. God understand. That's the issue. It's like, if you, if you, this is where like a lot of false gospel is proclaimed, right? Chris, for, oh, you know what? God's good with you the way you are. Well, not really, you know, and that's not what the scriptures say. So, but the good news says that we could repent, you know, and a sadness that brings repentance, you know, and a godly sorrow, so to speak, you know, and that's a good thing, you know, and so at any rate, I mean, obviously any believer, does not need to shudder at his eternity because God has done it all. But mm. if, if there's something in our lives that we just say is the undisputed king of our lives other than Christ, then that's when we need to be worried about, you know, or concerned about. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Thank you for that just gospel reminder. It's always just much needed, you know. Um, you know, the way that you defined uh, relevance, um, and, and I defined it as um, just relevance, it, it means to matter. Um, and, you know, even in your sharing, you said it could be, you know, the way you look, whether you're, you know, beautiful or handsome or your status or your net worth, you know, whatever all these other things are that makes us matter to people um, is, is relevance. I feel like it, it's very difficult for Christians um, because, I know a lot of people who are very ambitious and so they have this ambition and, and they want to, they want to be successful. You know, they want to uh, ex- uh, be at the top of their field, whatever that is. Um, and in some ways, the more you quote unquote rise or climb in some ways, it opens a lot of doors uh, to, to people and to get different platforms. How, what would you say to someone who does have a lot of ambition, um, and, and they're a Christian, you know, how would you kind of advise them or, or share some kind of wisdom to, to someone in that situation? Well, I think that's a great gift that you have. And, and I think having being an ambitious person is a gift from the Lord. And for example, I mean, people that, that I've coached or coached with, some the driven people are the ones who are most successful generally and no different from in the church i mean there's christians who have different levels of drive and motivation and i'll just say this why do you want to be successful that's the motivation of like okay why are you so driven is it for your own fame Hmm. or is it to make jesus more famous and so oftentimes i talk about this incident that we had with the Seahawks when I was coaching in the NFL where at a Bible study, I remember asking some of the players and coaches, why do we want to win the Super Bowl this year? Is it to build our own platform, our own stature, our own fame, or is it to have a greater platform to talk to billions of people about the treasure that Christ Jesus is, right? And so it's just, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, Chris, it could be for it could be whole holy ambition or it could mm. be selfish ambition. And so it's just a constant tension. Doesn't mean like, okay, oh my goodness, part of that was for me. Oh, just repent. I mean, it's a constant thing. I mean, you and I know it as as our, some of our work is very public, you know, as a coach is very public, but as a preacher, as a teacher of the word, like you are and I, it's very public. So it's like, I mean, it's a constant tension. One of the things I'm praying for before I go up to preach is. Lord, guard my heart from sin. Mm. May this be about you, right? And so I don't want people to be uh, in a moment of like uh, being uh, debilitated in the sense of like, oh my goodness, like uh, this is, I'm scared of sinning. Well, if you're going to think that way, you're not going to do anything for God because everything has has an opportunity to be about us and not about the Lord. So I just say constantly being in prayer life, Bible says pray without prayer, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean we're just sitting in our 
basement praying all day. It means that you were in constant communion. We're practicing the presence of God constantly. So having that dialogue uh, cognitively or even as a spirit is uh, groaning for us, we're just immersed with Lord, please guard me from sin. Help me to be faithful to you. And uh, so I'd say steward that gift of ambition. I think it's a good thing. It's a great thing. And I mean, you look at the, 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 the greats of our Christian faith, all of them were ambitious, I would imagine. You know, I mean, maybe there were a handful that I can't think of right now, but every single one of them. Do you think Abraham was ambitious to leave his home? Do you think Moses was ambitious to leave the palace? You know, King David, do you think he was ambitious to come off the field to fight the giant? Even days, people, pastors and, and missionaries of our days, you know, do you think they're ambitious? Like Martin Lloyd-Jones leave the medicine to become a preacher? I mean, I think he was pretty ambitious, you know. And so God uses people in a very unique way. The danger is that the higher you get, the greater temptation to fall. And so those are the things that we have to guard ourselves about, you know. And, and it's not about us. It's all a grace that God gives us. So. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. We're just going to be that much more aware of that. And I think I think having accountability with other brothers and sisters are very is very helpful and very much necessary. Mm, absolutely. I think prayer, uh, being aware of it, community, like everything you're saying. And, and I think the beautiful thing is, even if our ambition, um, you know, because we're, we're never perfect, e even if it does go sideways, God still can use you know, our brokenness, you know, uh, to do his work. And so I think, no, that's, that, that's such a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, I have one final question, uh, Pastor Rocky, before we wrap up. Um, and, and this came in um, particularly, and, and I, I love this question uh, that, that came in. It says, um, what are some of the current challenges of the Asian American church uh, to reach to the next generation? And so I'm thinking um, not about millennials because I'm a millennial. I'm, I'm not the next generation, I think, um, but it's Gen Z, um, Alpha, um, you know, just, you know, what, what does that look like um, specifically from the Asian American church to reach them? Well, this is a, when you say Asian American, just we got to keep in mind that we have a journey to America. And so understanding and embracing the advantages of being Asian American, you know, meaning who are we, who, what are the people, uh, people groups that make us, make us, you know, and in large part, I, I think I shared this before is that as Asian Americans, we don't have any extra baggage with the, with the ethnic groups in America. Mm. Now, going back to Asia, that might be a different story, but I'm talking about in America and just really embracing that, you know, whether it's white America, black America, or or uh, Hispanics in Southern California, generally there's not much uh, extra baggage that we have. So we're able to just come in and, and be judged on the uh, on the merit of who we are in Christ. So I think we need to take advantage of that. And this is one of the things that I've learned, no matter what generation, whether, whether it's uh, the boomer generation or millennials or Gen X or Gen Z, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants to know when you approach somebody, is this a real person in front of me? Is this person a person of integrity? Or is this person just telling me what I want to know or hear? And what I mean by that is, you know, I think football players or great athletes are the best at, one of the best at judging character. And what I mean by that is, so to, in order to make it to the National Football League at that level, that means that God blessed you athletically. Ever since you're a little boy, you're treated a certain way. You know, you're the best athlete. People liked you. You go to high school, you make more friends because of that. Then you go to the college and, and college recruiters and other people start treating you a certain way to get them to go to college. And then you, there's a certain notoriety, sort of popularity. And then you go to the NFL, there's agents, there's people, there's people whose jobs depend on your success. There are people who want to take selfies with you and post you up on, on, on social media and say, hey, I know this guy. And so athletes understand if they're being used or not, meaning mm -hmm. is this person here because they love me and they care for me, or is this person just here and telling me what I want to hear so that 
you know, they could get something from you, whether advancing your own career or just advancing your social status, whatever it may be. But as soon as the, the person realizes, oh, no, this guy actually cares about me. And this guy actually is telling me what he really believes instead of telling me what I think, what he thinks I want to hear. That makes a big difference. So as Asian American, it's the key is this. Do we know the scriptures? Do we know the truth of who God is? And from there, all the relevance that ever matters is that God affirms who I am in Christ. That's the trick, guys. It's not getting, receiving any relevance from the culture or man. I receive all the relevance I ever would want to know because A, I made in God's image. B, Christ, God himself, the creator of the universe, died for my sins. That's all the affirmation and relevance I would ever want or hope. And so do we live that out? Do we live that out in the culture? Do we live that out to the next generation? Do we? Is this a genuine faith that we have? So meaning, if, you, if we're talking about just ministering to our own homes, our children, our wives, can they see genuineness in us? Not perfection, but genuineness. Like, yeah, my dad, my mom, my brother, sister, he or she doesn't love Jesus perfectly, but they genuinely love the Lord. I, I think... That is one of the biggest issues. Is this real? Mm -hmm. And that we're not trying to pass on a, a culture of evangelicalism or some kind of a Christian church culture to our people. So we teach them how to perform on some kind of evangelical, Asian American evangelical stage. But is this real? You know, and so, uh, Chris, I, I would say this much. One of the ways to demonstrate the power of the gospel in your life is repentance, like you talked about and I talked about earlier. Are we apologizing to people in our homes and our family groups and our next generation when we do mess up, when we wrong people, say, I'm so sorry, that wasn't right. Please mm -hmm. forgive me. That communicates that your worth, your identity isn't being right or being righteous, but in Christ's righteousness, right? And so that's, that's it, you know, Chris, I would say that is a big thing. And I think culturally, from older to younger, that may be some of the things that hold us back as Asian Americans, where we may have to think we have to maintain a certain status. So I can never say I'm wrong to the younger generation. What? We all know that's not real, right? I mean, honestly, we don't need to play that charade. And this, this is the thing that we need to understand as Asian Americans, what part of Asian-ness, Asian culture is in alignment with the scriptures and what part is of the world? Right? What part is a doctrine of a demon or what part is, yeah, this is exactly how the scriptures talk about in, as it term and as it relates to being a man and a woman, you know, and so, and how I act and how I think, you know, so I know, I just know, and just how I was raised, I'm a second generation Japanese American, meaning my parents were born in Japan. I carry a lot of great things that they taught me, mm -hmm. but also I re recognize, hey, that's not Christ. That's not Jesus. So, and just be able to function in these ways. And I'd say one of the things that big in the Japanese American culture, which may be in the Korean culture, maybe it perhaps is that we will keep things at a surface level at times, with, even with relationships that we know and everything's not as transparent as it could be, or we don't do Matthew 18, 15 to 17 with one another where we, Hey, there's an issue. I seen you. Can I talk to you because I care about you? what is going on in this part of your life where we just kind of maybe whitewash it out and it's okay on the surface, but getting at the heart of it is where uh, of our Christianity is where it communicates how real the gospel is to you and me, you know, and, and, and in essence communicates the realness, the genuineness of the gospel to the next generation. So genuineness is what I would say is to, in response to your question. And I, I know I know, long way getting there but that's it's, it's just what i'm what we're talking about are we genuinely in love with christ you know and so and can the people see that in us no absolutely you know so as someone who's d doing youth ministry right now i think that's so important i, I think you're, you're spot on when our leaders are genuine when they you know are walking with jesus loving the lord and really care about students and are vulnerable, that's, those are the kind of leaders that um, our students really connect with, I think. And so thank you for sharing. Oh, 
No, no, Chris. I mean, think about it from the scriptures. First uh, Timothy four sixteen, I think, if that's the right address. Paul tells Timothy, right, "Watch your life and your doctrine." You know, our life and, and the way we live and the, and the things that we teach they go hand in hand, right? I mean, it's not like I teach something but I don't live it. And so the life undergirds the, the the truth that we talk about, you know. And mm -hmm. so, watch your life and your doctrine is something that's been a big thing for me, and and uh, that's some things that's been told to me by my elders and the people that I respect and helping me get into the ministry. And that's the life of the pastor. But really, that's no different from the life of the disciple or at home or anywhere else. You know, watch your life and your doctrine. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much, Pastor Rocky. Um, could, could I ask you to close and pray for our church, Living Hope, um, sure. just as we wrestle through all of this, all, all that we talked about? Could you close us in prayer? Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Thank you, Living Hope Church. Father, I thank you for uh, the grace you poured on uh, Living Hope Church, Lord. Thank you for the leadership. They genuinely love you. They love the church family. Thank you for appointing shepherds that, and and leaders that would care for your body there, Lord. And I just, Father, I just pray for just a renewed interest and renewed love, a deeper love for you, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. In particular, during this, this 2020 year where things have been challenging, Father, I pray, Lord, that you open up uh, darkened eyes and, and clogged ears to be able to see and hear spiritually, Lord, more of who you are. And Father, if there's any issues in our lives where we need to repent, I pray you you bring these things to mind and that we simply repent and then re and rely and trust in the gospel that we say we believe in. So Father, I pray for a special blessing upon Living Hope Church where the people have a deep, profound love for you and for one another. And Lord, I pray that you create a deep hunger for your word or the scriptures, Lord. So thank you, Father. Thank you for Pastor Chris. Thank you for his love for you and his church family, Lord, at Living Hope Church. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor Rocky. Thank you, brother. How, how did it go this